Hi, everyone. Here we are for another episode of uh, The Three Amigos. And today we're going to take a look at a tool that's used um, predominantly to help companies get a sense as to where they are before they go too far into their strategic planning process. And Ron's going to begin by explaining, you know, what a SWOT is so you can better understand what we're talking about. And then we're going to go into more detail and Ed's going to help us understand how he used it in his time, his uh, experience uh, with companies, and we're going to go into more depth. So having said that, Ron, I'm going to pass it on to you to kind of help us understand what is a SWOT and how can it be of value? Okay. Well, a SWOT, uh, as the acronym uh, points out, is strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And those four categories really help a company think about what's uh, going on internally uh, with their own company and the efficiencies and profitability, et cetera. And externally, uh, having to do with markets and competitors uh, and uh, in environment, uh, general environment and economic environment. So when you do a, a, a general plan or you uh, update your plan or you start strategic planning, you have to have some place to start. And this is one of the tools that uh, really helps a business think through how to get going and to uh, get in input from all, of the, from all of the employees who happen to be uh, in the meeting. And as you can see here, uh, what we've done is Ed Lasak has put together these eight drivers of a business. And he's gonna discuss a little bit about the importance of here in, in driver number eight, forecasting and evaluating either on a quarterly basis. But um, Ed, from your experience, would you be doing a SWOT on a quarterly basis or when do you think it's best for a company to do this? Well, I, I think uh, the SWOT analysis is an extremely important part of strategic planning. And strategic planning is, is very, very important for determining uh, the future of the company and adding value to its bottom line. Um, I always like to look at it from a numbers perspective that without strategic planning, you would do business the same way as you've been doing it and your results would be classified as business as usual. Um, strategic planning gets key people involved in the, out, in the company and outside of the company to strategically analyze where they're at and where they want to go. And one of the most important tools is the SWOT analysis. It sounds pretty basic, uh, but it can be extremely powerful if you have a meeting or a series of meetings discussing it where everybody leaves their title at the door and you analyze the business, what you think you're doing well, what, what areas you think you're not doing well, and what are the potential opportunities and threats uh, coming down the road. So the bottom line with a strategic plan, and, and this is a big part of the strategic plan, is to show superior results on the bottom line and to reduce risk. Uh, those are the two important goals of a strategic plan. So at this point in time, I'd like to kind of dig deeper now into um, the SWOT analysis and how powerful it can be. And I, and I think uh, strategic planning should be addressed every year. First of all, you have to have one and then it should be updated every year and the SWOT analysis should be updated accordingly. And I think that's kind of why it's on the chart here as one of the eight value drivers, because without it and without that reconciliation to performance and the, and the plan, you're not really going to know whether you're making any progress or not. So I think I'll leave, I'll turn it over to uh, Ray now and he can talk more about um, some of his experiences and uh, utilizing the SWOT analysis. Yeah, I think what I wanted to think about uh, um, in the past, you know, when I'm doing a SWOT, you know, I find that it's really important to help people understand more clearly what are they talking about. So we do kind of an environmental scan in terms of the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, but it's based on this what we call this this acronym PESTLE. You know, what are the political factors? In the example today, you know, we're we're three days into a new administration. Well, what is that going to mean for your business? And how is that going to affect it? Social factors. What's going on in the 
in the environment that may in fact be affecting your business or not affecting legal factors. There are things coming down the road in terms of tax policy or regulatory uh, importance that may be needed to think about economic factors. You know, we're in the midst of a, uh, uh, a recession. You know, where do you think it's going to go in your market, in your neighborhood? Technological factors, you know, what's going on in the marketplace in terms of software or hardware that you could be using to make your company more effective and then finally, environmental factors. What are the things that are going on that you could literally take advantage of? So my experience is when, when you start doing this external span, uh, scan, it gives you a much greater focus as to what the SWAT can do and where you need to focus your energy depending on what's happening. And so that's why I think this is really important. Ed, uh, from your experience, uh, does this resonate with you? What are you thinking? Well, I think the list you have on the screen is very powerful and very important to address these issues. Uh, unfortunately, when we're involved in running a company, we're sitting in the seat. We're so involved in day-to-day -day activities uh, to produce product and sell product and, and distribute product and then bill for it um, that you really have no time to think about these factors. And um, so these are more long-term issues that could impact the business. And it's very healthy to have a review of these to determine uh, you know, how well you're doing, where you're at in each one of these things. Uh, some of these are risks, some of these are opportunities to improve profitability, um, but it doesn't really matter because the bottom line, you need to address them and make sure you kind of look behind, uh, behind the corner here to see what's coming up. And yeah. Fortunately, uh, we do our day-to-day -day activities. We don't have that time to do so. So I think this is this would be a, a great slide to start a SWOT analysis, right? Yeah, I agree. Thank it's, you. Uh, uh, it's got a lot of good stuff on there. It doesn't necessarily help us look around the corner. Uh, for instance, we're in a period now, some people have said it's a 100-year 100, 100 problem, uh, but things do happen. And and, I, and uh, part of the SWAT, of course, would include, uh, if you get through these basic things, part of it would include, well, sort of what if, you know, what if we lose yeah. our electricity? What if we have uh, continued ongoing COVID for another three years? And that's that sort of thing. But you got to go through these basics and come up with the information uh, first. Yes. It's a good list. And, right. And that that's why, you know, many times I find that you know, it's hard for us to get our, wrap our head around what should we be looking at. And so I've found this an excellent way of getting people to think about the sort of things that might impact it. And then, as you pointed out, Ron, there could be other uh, things like COVID that aren't in there or other factors. But it, the purpose is when you're doing a SWOT is to get people to think as broadly as possible. Absolutely. So then we go. And that, list, that list does that. It, it gets Yeah, I think so. Outside the day-to-day -day activity of the business. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it does it. You you would talk about COVID under in, in uh, economics at the very least, if not a bunch of other ones. Right, right, exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So then, what I want to do is that there's an internal scan, which uh, you know I've given the acronym Spice, which is you know what's going on in society here. You know, respecting neighbors, positive relationship, partners, and you could expand this list, but you know it might be suppliers, it could be unions. Investors, you know, who, who are your family, or friends, employees, banks? Private equity, customers, uh, I'm on the lobby side. And I think as Ed said, you know, part of this to do an effective job with the SWAT, you have to do this in the context of the numbers that are already there. Uh, do you guys have any observation on, on this or anything that you feel could be added to make it more effective as we move into the actual block, which talks about strengths weaknesses, opportunities, and threats? Well, I think you've covered most of the stakeholders here. Uh, and of course, the society as a whole would be a, uh, a, a, way, a way to broaden that out if, if you missed something. Um, my only thought would be, if you put society computing at the end, it would pick up all of the things that weren't discussed. Yeah, no, it would. It's just that uh, that wouldn't work for spice. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. You're actually, yeah, you, you're right. I, I certainly don't mean to mess up your acronym there. So let's right, just right, leave, right. It, leave it where it is. Right. So anyway, uh, uh, Ed, any thoughts, you know, from your uh, 
you know, no, many think, years uh, of experience as a, yeah, as a chief operating great. officer? I think it's the next slide after the first slide. This comes next. And uh, how, you know, when you look at your business and you look at the future of business, all these different um, stakeholders have to be considered as part of the strategic plan. That's, I think that's very well said. So now we're going to actually look at uh, SWAT. And here's an example of that. Um, given what we just talked about, either the pestle or the spice, you know, what do we do now as we move forward? We're going to go through and we're going to talk about strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. And this kind of gives you a sense as to how to figure that. On the left side, you have positives. On the right, you have negatives. On the top, you have internals. And on the bottom, you have externals. So this kind of helps us better understand how the tool is used and, it, and it's a functional picture that really enables you to understand. So then as we move forward, here's what I think has been helpful in terms of our working together. And if uh, you and um, the two of you wanna add something, please do. But you know, basically I start with this and I look at the strengths and I say, okay, given the external factors and the internal factors, you know, what are the things that are going on that give us um, you know, kind of a leg up in the marketplace. Take a look at these and, you know, tell me a little bit about your experience and what you think, how, how we could use this to help an organization better understand what it should be leveraging as it moves forward. Well, I like, I think I would look at the external before the internal. Um, part of, part of uh, what influences your, your comments in the discussion about internal is what's going on externally. So, and I, I would say that uh, uh, the one thing that I typically focus on myself, uh, and I haven't done nearly as many of these as, as the two of you have, but uh, because I focus primarily on revenue generation, but I always like to think about uh, customers as an external in a way, because You've got your customers, and then you have the customers that your competitors have and you don't have. Uh, Very good point. You've got the customers that um, could be your customers, but there's something blocking <coughs> the, the ability for you to get them. And okay. so, uh, you know, everything, all of these, when you think of in terms of your niche market and your customers, all of these things from political factors, social, legal, economic, all of those need to be partially in the context of how does it affect a customer. Um, right. You know, there may or may not be any legal factors that would pop up in that, but there are certainly economic factors, technological factors. Um, customers have expectations of certain kinds of service that uh, today that usually means technological support. Uh, and so, you know, many of these things, you know, are, are important. Uh, right. And environmental factors, for instance, some kinds of customers are anti-environment, they call them brown customers, but there are probably, there are a lot more customers that are on the green side that do care right. about environmental factors. And so you need to know and understand your customers very well in order to be able to have a relevant uh, discussion about it. Now, having said that, if you don't know your customers very well, I think you still go through a SWOT in order to right. be able to get started. It may take two or three sessions in order to be able to nail this down because you discover you don't have the information or the data in order to have the rest of the conversation. So this and is a real a, opportunity a, to, to look at that and find out what you don't know. Well, I think uh, and that's, a, that's a very good point, Ron. You know, you actually identified how you know, what it did for you is it said, look, you know, how do we, how do we integrate the external and the internal to really understand better, you know, how we gain customers or how we assure that the customers we have stay. So, you know, the, the purpose of this, again, is to get people to think differently, you know, and, and I know when uh, Ed and I have worked together, we found that just by getting people to think in terms of these four buckets, it changes the way they look at their business. Um, is that fair, Ed? Yeah, I, I think uh, uh, the customer all obviously is all is the ultimate perspective on all this. But I find it extremely helpful when you sit down with the management team and the ownership, mm -hmm. all coming with different perspectives, 
and you say, okay, what's the strengths of the company and what are the weaknesses of the company? And I think by going through that process, I think you find out a lot. Yes. And I think you, you find out that there's differences between uh, frontline management compared to maybe ownership. They look at things differently. I think it's a great opportunity for ownership to really dive in deeply as to how their people feel about how the company is performing. So I think that's extremely valuable. And I think the other thing you find when you go through this process with the management team is you find the people that take ownership and you find the people that point the finger. And that's why I like to have all the different disciplines involved in this process. Yeah, absolutely. They have a tendency of pointing the finger and it's usually pointing the finger at sales. Sales isn't delivering. Right, right. That's a common situation when you do these things. And then when you dig down deep, you find out, well, everybody has a role um, yep. in, in making that happen. And they're not doing their roles either. So right. I, I think it really helps show the warts of how they work together as a team uh, or how they don't work together as a team. And how do they get everybody on the same page um, to agree on what the strengths and weaknesses are? And then what do we got to do to take advantage of our strengths and minimize our weaknesses? Right. Yeah. And I think I've been the uh, brunt, the brunt of some of those kinds of discussions, uh, being the guy that's supposed to increase revenue. And uh, my, the way that I normally help people understand that it's not about me. Of course, I'm usually the advisor. I'm not the, the guy out, you know, doing actually doing the work or selling. But um, I, I simply explain to them that you know about 60% of the activity in any organization has to do with marketing. In other words, delivering products to a specific customer. And so you know most of those people are involved in that 60%. <clears throat> They're in customer service or quality control, manufacturing. Those are those are all things that. The customer makes decisions about as to whether or not they buy. So it's very, very, you know, I've always repelled that by saying to so-and-so, gee, you know, you're, you're suggesting that you need more to fill a certain machine. However, I got X percentage of rejections and customers are telling me they're not going to buy because your quality is crap. So right. um, it does, it does go across the whole company and it really helps everybody to understand that they all have a part in, in satisfying the customer. Well, and I think Absolutely. the point you made is, and Ed made as well, is that the best SWATs are always done in the presence of good data. You know, the more numbers you have, whether it, as you're pointing, uh, you know, what's going on with your customers directly, or um, Ed saying, you know, what are your margins last year? Are they getting better or worse? What are you trying to get to? The SWAT enables you to really think about that in ways that, Normally you wouldn't, and using these two acronyms gives us, you know, uh, to, to make sure we don't miss something that ultimately is critical to our moving forward in the way we'd like. Yeah. Yeah, I think the data is extremely important. I think um, each discipline doing a presentation on uh, what they're doing and uh, what impact it's having on the company and hearing from them what they think some of the weaknesses and strengths are, I think it's really helpful and bringing everybody together um, to understand the perspective of the company, not the department. I, we really yeah. don't care about the department. We more care about our customers and we care about the company's performance. And everybody in that room who's part of this process, it has to, has to do their part, has to be accountable uh, for making changes that are really going to benefit the, the future results of the company. Right. And I think, you know, as Ron, you were alluding to earlier, you know, we've kind of evolved from customer management to relationship uh, management, you know, stakeholder relationship management, because basically if you do an effective job of managing all these stakeholders, you know, they will deliver results for you. So part of the SWOT is to be able to get a better feel as to which ones we need to develop relationships with and which ones we may be ignoring or not listening to as carefully as we could, like you said, you know, suddenly we were getting these quality things and nobody's, nobody's paying attention and uh, they could have been catastrophic, you know? Yeah, absolutely. 
So let's move to the next part because this is the upper part of the SWOT. This is the strengths and weaknesses. And what they reveal for you is this. Here's your opportunities. You know, how do you look at this now and, and how do you analyze it to be able to say, as Ron did, you know, if we improve our quality, that's going to help us with our customer retention. And to Ed's point, that's going to give us better margins and better numbers and get us closer to the objective for the company, which is to increase its value to the point where the owners can sell it for what they believe it's worth as opposed to what they think it's worth. Uh, well, any it, observations it on this? Selling. I, I, we talked about this before. If you are got a management team, the purpose of that management team and ownership is to improve the operations of the company and the profitability of the company. And um, otherwise, you really, in my opinion, I've said this before, and somebody may want to hang me about this, but hang me for this. But the bottom line is, if you don't improve, why do you need management? Because you got people doing the jobs, and they're doing their jobs well. Uh, management has to add value. And right. that's why they need to be part of the SWOT analysis. And that's why we need their input for determining strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and then also look at some of the threats out there that could put us out of business. So Right. And I, I'll go to the threat slide because I think you really hit the nail on the head. And what I heard you say, Ed, is that a lot of what we've experienced uh, working with a company on this is that it really eliminates the silos. You know, people come into these meetings, you know, defending their territory, and they leave the meeting defending the business. Um, if that makes sense, that's one of the one of the benefits of going through this process. They begin to see their role. It's like in the military. You know, yes, a frontline soldier isn't the end all and be all, but if he doesn't understand his role and his responsibility, you know, air defenses and other things can't be of much help. And so the same thing is true inside a company. The more we get them to realize, this is my role, this is what I'm functioning. And now that I understand, I understand the external things that are going on, I understand the internal, I'm much more engaged. And that's what really drives you know, the, the value that we're trying to achieve. Absolutely. And, and, and I think it'll be, you'll, you'll develop meaningful strategies that you will put people in charge of to monitor and be accountable for to measure progress. You know, as part of the eight drivers, we measure progress quarterly, right? Well, we ought to be looking at things quarterly. Are we, are we making progress? Is the quality right, right. person, is the quality team doing what they're supposed to do to produce high quality products? Yeah. High quality right. products, like Ron said, you can sell them and you can sell them at a premium. Um, you can't blame the sales department if, you, if you're producing a lot of junk. Nobody right. wants to sell junk. And I think it's also and, important and to, I think it's also important to uh, look at uh, threats in, in the perspective of, um, well, as Ed, Ed just mentioned, if management is not adding value, then you know what are they doing? Why do we need management? So, right. You know, right. the question is, well, so where's the value and um, what should we be working on? But I think, I think that one of the threats that I, uh, in going through this, I didn't see a specific category. It may come up in a discussion, but one of the threats is continuous improvement. And I don't mean mm -hmm. that in the manufacturing sense, of course, that's, that's an opportunity. Uh, I mean that just because things change. Um, I think uh, somewhere in the in the range of uh, oh I've, I, I'm I'm sorry it's I had it in the top of my head but a very large number of the uh, Fortune 500 companies will will be out of business in 30 years. They they don't right. they don't stay right. around that long. And you would think that right. you know you think of a Ma Bell or all of our phone companies today and oh my gosh look what's happened to to the phone array in right. the last right. 20 years. Right. So there are lots of changes that go on all the time. Well, if you can't get better, it, then your, your competitors will. And so you'll right. uh, many small businesses slowly go out of business because 
they stopped trying to be any good in the last, say, five or 10 years of the owner's life cycle. And they just kind of right. give up. So as a result, the business doesn't go forward. You don't fix manuf manufacturing problems. You don't increase uh, technology. So you're taking care of customers better. Um, you don't uh, in increase your relationships with your customers or, or any of the stakeholders because you kind of believe that, well, a customer comes and picks it off the shelf and pays a price. And that's all there is to it. Well, that's thinking right, of right. about 30, 40 years ago. That's, right. that's not right. the way successful businesses think about this anymore. So, you know, that's, that is one of the things I think that a lot of people might come up with a, just a few threats. But if they come up with just a few, they've forgotten to consider that their, their competitors are moving objects. They are not yeah. uh, sitting still, and you can't sit still either. Well, I think uh, the point that you're making here, uh, Ron, and I'll let you go, Ed, you know, is that, you know, by doing the SWAT, it keeps this in front of you. You know, with, with a good strategic plan, you already have numbers, you already have goals, you have objectives, but the SWAT says, okay, as you pointed out, what's changed? What's happened in the marketplace? so that everybody involved is really focused on how their role and their responsibility plays into this. And it keeps them consciously aware of the, the marketplace that's dynamic instead of being distracted by a, a lot of stuff that really is not relevant. And you know, we've all seen that. Yeah. Ed, you were gonna add something? Yeah, there, it's not only threats from existing competitors, it's threats from new ways of doing business. Yeah, yeah, and, I, and that's kind of what I meant to say too. Yeah, right. because uh, you, there's all these startup companies that find a way to find a way to better serve the customer at lesser cost with more robust solutions. And if you continue rowing the boat the same way day in and day out, it's not going to get you where you want to be. And it's going to eventually put you out of business because you're not moving what the expectations of the customer and the customer really rules the roost because yes. that's the pretty set that pretty much sets the expectations. They're going to use you now as long as you're adding value. But if you can find new ways of adding value, uh, that means you are going to be creating new products and services that could be very helpful to you in the future. We talk about the eight drivers of value. One of them is looking at new ways of doing business and making investments in new ways and new products or uh, expansion or whatever that makes sense because staying the way you are is probably going to put you out of business over the long term. You have to move. You have to get bigger. You have to get more profitable and you have to do more things and you have to do them very well. Well, and I think what, a, you know, I, going back to the model here again, you know, the value of doing this, as you pointed out on a quarterly basis, it keeps everybody focused and it enables you to really review what's going on because our experience, you know, even ourselves, as a rule, we tend to get, <laughs> as I like to say, we all get very good at doing things we shouldn't be doing at all. <laughs> and so when we do the SWAT, it permits the team to kind of look out and say, gosh, yeah, what can I assume as responsibility, as you were pointing out, Ron, for continuous improvement? And Ed, from the onset, has always said, you know, people need to be thinking about their job, not only in terms of what they're doing, but what could be done more effectively or better to make them more competitive in the marketplace. And by doing this on a quarterly basis, it keeps that in, you know, in, in front of mind, so to speak. I think it's really important when you do one of these analysis that you have some outside perspective from the company. Because yeah. I, I, I think knowing what other industries are doing, knowing what other companies are doing in that industry can add significant value to the SWOT analysis and, analysis and strategic planning process. Right. And without it, I think it's pretty hard. I think it's it's like trying to figure out where you're going when you're underground and you have no idea what's going on above you. Right. Uh, oh, and I think that points that points to the internal external, uh, you know, dichotomy that, that that is inherent in this process. 
and that is that a lot of a lot of uh, folks, especially employees, are going to be comfortable talking about what's going on internally. But yes. the nature of most jobs is to pay attention to what's in front of you, not to pay attention to what's external. And, yes. and in, in fact, you know, there are lines of thinking out there that, you know, pay, pay attention to your own business and it'll, it'll take care of you. Uh, yes. But you, there are things that creep up uh, or actually don't, some of them don't really creep up, do they? They just, they just come in in an explosion when you, yeah. When you take a look at what technology has done to so many industries, uh, it's, it's very apparent to most people. I think what some small businesses do is they say, well, uh, we've got technology and we've got a system and we spend a lot of money on it. And that's kind of the way we do it. But um, you still have to investigate your own systems and compare them to what's outside. So outsiders can help you uh, get that perspective, and sometimes that's that's really valuable. Unfortunately, well, I think many times they're so busy doing their day, daily routines, they don't know what their competitors are doing. They don't have relationships with their competitors. They don't have worse yet. They don't have relationships with their customers. Sometimes they don't have relationships with their vendors uh, because they're so busy solving problems in the company that. And when you and, and to for instance, talking to people that sell products, you can learn a lot about your competitors by having great yeah. relationships yeah. with right. equipment vendors. They yeah. know everything that's going on with the co competition because they're in there selling. Yeah. And uh, if you don't look outside of your organization, I don't see how you can really be nimble enough to take advantages of opportunities. Yeah, and, and I think that's why, you know, underlying this is this notion of stakeholder relationship management, because as Ron was saying, you know, when once you understand the relationships and to your point, Ed, you go out to those people that are already selling to your competitors and invite them in to give you some insights, they will, because they need your business and vice versa. And so the more, you know, by doing this swap, we get we get a much clearer picture as to what needs to be done to move us from where we are to where we want to be. And the whole point of this exercise, whether it's for this quarter or next quarter, is to increase the value of the business. So what we've done here is we've helped, hopefully, people understand how a SWOT analysis done on a regular, consistent basis will, like Ron said, permit you to see threats from the outside and also help you under, un identify how um, either departments or individuals inside can help you really tweak that and increase value. So um, I wanted to go kind of, uh, we've been through this. Is there anything else that you guys would like to add or can I kind of wrap this up for today? Well, I guess the one thing I would, I would like to say is there has to be, to be a good process, good SWOT analysis, there has to be tension. And there has to be uh, putting people outside their comfort level or figuring out how to do things more effectively. We, we all come in and we all think we're doing things 100%. We, we're not challenging ourselves to do things better. And I, I really believe there has to be some, some tension. It's got to be professional. But I think that open, honest environment of people giving their opinions on what they think uh, is, is going well and what isn't going well and where they're missing the boat and where they may have some threats down the, uh, down the uh, downstream of uh, uh, where they're going um, is really important for having a good SWOT analysis and strategic plan process. And then the follow up on the numbers to quarterly review the progress to the projections of the strategic plan are extremely important. And the reports from each one of the um, um, groups of people that are doing special initiatives, you'll, you'll find out a lot. You'll find out that some um, are doing a very good job and you'll find out some are, aren't taking it seriously. And there has to be an adjustment to get everybody on the, on the same page. So I'd like to just kind of parrot that just a little little bit uh, too. It 
the, you know, we've talked a lot about the advantages and I think it's appropriate to also talk a little, little bit about uh, some of the downside. Uh, I don't think, see a big downside in doing a SWOT. Uh, however, uh, I've been involved in several, uh, several SWATs that end up in a, in a quota plan. And especially, this is especially true of large organizations and governments are just horrible at this. They spend a lot of time and effort, you know, go on a three-day retreat, have a bunch of people around and they put this together and then somebody diligently puts the notes together and turns it into a, a three-ring binder and uh, they, they have done their duty for the year. Well, that's just, that's just folly. It's, it's yeah. nice to get together and have this conversation and get everybody's input. But the truth of the matter is it have to, has to be distilled. Yeah. And it has to be turned into action uh, with uh, you know, the feedback loops, information coming back in, uh, and, and some decisions on what, what constitutes progress in terms of measurement. So without right. those things, uh, and we've talked about that you know, under, the, under the overall planning umbrella, but without those things, doing a SWAT uh, can, can be a huge waste of time. Uh, small business people, many times are not interested in doing a SWAT because they maybe have done one and they found that they had a bunch of stuff, but what they ended up with is so much information because everybody's throwing terms out and somebody's writing all these things on the wall on, you know, on, you know, big notepads. And, and that whole thing is, is, is an exercise that sometimes doesn't really accomplish very much. And so small business people look at that and kind of go, oh man, what a big waste of time. That cost me thousands of dollars and I didn't see any value from that. So it's awfully important to, to, to do the, the next pieces in order to be able to get that to work. Uh, I wanted to briefly mention that uh, you know, we've done a piece on customer feedback and you can find it on our channel. And uh, customer feedback is a way to gather the information which will help feed into your financials and other management reports to give you some of the numbers to determine if you're uh, making progress. And then also I wanna say that our, our last program, we talked about uh, outside people on the board, but a lot of those concepts uh, have to do with finding good outside people and, and how to have that external viewpoint. So. Some of you may want to go back and take a look at the, the one from uh, last week to uh, flesh this in just a little bit. No, that's a good point. And I think uh, what my experience has been, and I know when Ed and I have worked together, when you give people a chance to uh, buy in, you know, they tend to pitch in. And I think what this does, if it's used effectively, it can really help refine the strategic plan moving forward and keep it moving forward. But as you pointed out, Ron, if this is just done with the intention of throwing stuff against the wall and, and trying to figure out what sticks, it's a waste of time. But if it's well integrated into the process, so every, every quarter, everybody realizes we're gonna go through this with a specific intention of identifying areas in which we can, to your point, continuously improve the organization, everybody gets excited. I've never met a person who didn't feel like in their role or responsibility, if they were being heard and their ideas are being integrated in some meaningful way, they perform higher, productivity goes up, profit goes up, it all makes a good difference. But if it isn't used pro properly, it can only, it can do damage. I agree with you. If, if, so, if, uh, if done Ed, did you wanna add, did you wanna wrap something up? I just wanna say one other point on that same vein. And that is, if you do it right and you have accountability, and you review things on a quarterly basis, you'll find out that some of the members of your team may not have a future. And that's what every that's come up in every one of these that I've ever done is you find one or two people that talk a good game but don't perform. And as part of this process of accountability and quarterly reports, you find out who's on the team and who isn't on the team. Yeah. Yeah, it's and, and, and it's kind of self-selecting. It's amazing when you do that, eventually they either feel uncomfortable enough to leave on their own or 
you know, they move on in other ways. So um, yeah, very good point. Well, again, I want to thank both of you. Uh, again, this was really devoted to driver number eight, forecast and reevaluate on a quarterly basis using the SWOT. Um, and uh, if you uh, in the audience have an interest, you can reach out to any one of us here at the emails that we have on the, on the page. And in the meantime, I want to thank everybody. Next week, um, we're going to be looking at a topic that, Ron, you kind of hinted at. What, uh, what are you thinking for our next session? 